best way to get uh, my attention is to give me pre-orders. And this is a particular distributor who has almost 10,000 products, all right? Now, uh, the, here, here's a classic thing. You can either work with a small distributor who has just about you know, 20, 30 brands, but you're risking your payments, you're risking, you know, a lot of things there. An ideal customer is like this Maverick company who has, you know, been in the business for almost 15 years or 10 years, which I would say is a good start, uh, who has, you know, about 600 to 700 accounts. So those are the kind of distributors you want to work with. Now, they already have so much portfolio, right? So for them, you know, uh, giving them a, a good kickstart by handing them some orders and commitment and showing proof, you know, in your brand is the best way. Uh, welcome again, guys. Uh, thanks for joining in. Uh, we will be, you know, we will be having uh, more people coming in as we go into the call, you know, many different places, uh, different brand owners are there. I think uh, export managers and salespeople. So I think this is really uh, overall an audience where small and medium sized brands or new brands, you know, who are looking for some real uh, cases and real questions. Uh, this will relate to all of you, right? So let's get started. Uh, I think a little bit about myself, uh, just so you know, to create the context here. Uh, I have uh, built my own brand. So I know you know, uh, what you're going through. And I really have done cold calling. Uh, you know, I've sold wine, beer, spirits myself. You know, I was also a wholesaler in New Jersey and Delaware. So I've owned and operated distribution houses as well. I had uh, 10 private label brands uh, built that into almost a uh, $5 million business from zero. So I really uh, have done, you know, so everything that I speak, uh, it's really based on uh, the real experience, uh, you know, not as a consultant, uh, not as an advisor. This is a really more of a real talk based on the experiences, you know, as a distributor, as a brand owner as well. So that's the context I wanted to put in. Uh, let's get started. I think... Uh, Maybe I can, I can, uh, I don't know if Mariva is here, but this was the first question, right, Angida? So you can, yeah, you can uh, ask the question and then we can just have that as you. Uh, who is attending here is how to get distributors' attention. Great. So I think uh, how to get distributors' attention. For sure, the most guaranteed way, there are many ways, but the simplest way is to get pre-sales, right? It is to give them the business. It is to show them that you understand the business. It is to really uh, go out and hand them orders, you know, for their customers. So uh, an ideal approach, what I would suggest is uh, really go in the market, you know, uh, build some traction out there. So I think what you need to do is you, we need to have uh, some customers on board, right? So the best advice is to really go out and here's what you do, you know, when you go out and build your pre-sale customers. You just have to aim for like 10 odd you know, retail accounts, 10 odd restaurant accounts. And that is enough proof that you've done the homework. That is enough uh, order book. You know, what you tell the retailer is, hey, you know, I'm talking with a couple of distributors on board, just so you know, uh, but I wanted to visit the market first. And I really wanted to, you know, uh, come and see you and uh, make sure that when we're launching, you know, we have some initial traction. So here's a launch deal that we are giving you. So you start, the, you, you get create an excitement at the retail level, you know, and then get the pre-commitments and then take that to the distributors that, okay, I've got them on board. Give me your first pallet. And here's what we're going to do. We're going to blow that pallet off. I'm going to come again in the market work and make sure that that pallet is going to be depleted within like 10 days of my market work. So that is how you get their attention. What they really want is minimize their risk. So as long as you can show them that you know their investment, which is in your pallet or a couple of pallets that they're getting started with, is almost risk-free. You know uh, the chances are really, really high that you will close them. So uh, as we have a lot of questions, I'm going to keep moving very fast here. Uh, but that is the best way to get their attention. Okay, so I'll recap it. Uh, make sure that what you are asking them, you know, is depleted from their warehouse in about you know seven to ten days. And what you've sold to the retailers, their customers is depleted in about 60 days. So, which means show them that these are the sales that you've got and this is the in-store tastings or market work or whatever promotion you're gonna do to make sure the stocks are depleted at the retail as well. And these two things, you know, will make sure that they're not uh, really, you know, uh, risking uh, a business venture with you.
So, um, so I'll send you this entire video, but in that uh, particular video, you know, he clearly uh, says for us. Uh, that the best way to get uh, my attention is to give me pre-orders. And this is a particular distributor who has almost 10,000 products, all right? Now, uh, the, here, here's a classic thing. You can either work with a small distributor who has just about, you know, 20, 30 brands, but you're risking your payments. You're risking, you know, a lot of things there. An ideal customer is like this Maverick company who has, you know, been in the business for almost 15 years or 10 years, which I would say is a good start, uh, who has, you know, about 600 to 700 accounts. So those are the kind of distributors you want to work with. Now, they already have so much portfolio, right? So for them, you know, uh, giving them a, a good kickstart by handing them some orders and commitment and showing proof, you know, in your brand is the best way. So what are the best states in which uh, to start distributing French brands? So I've just, you know, uh, I'm categorizing this as more of an import brands and the best, you know, uh, states to start with uh, for, you know, uh, imported brands is usually uh, the big ones, right? The California, Illinois, uh, Florida, Texas. Okay. So for, especially for the international brands, uh, here's another little growth hack that you, you can understand. Now, US is a three tier uh, system, right? So you have importer, uh, you have distributor, and you have retailer. Whereas in some states, like the ones I mentioned, there are two tier you know, possibilities, which means importers can also distribute in those states to the retail. Now, those are uh, the states that you would want to start with because you already have that importer for your international brand and they also have distribution, you know, to the retail directly. And those are, you know, uh, the states you really want to uh, pretty much get started with. So what helps distributors sell product most effectively? Okay. Uh, it's a good question because uh, that's something that you want to help them and, and uh, you want to make sure that they sell, right? Uh, and here's uh, some of the things that I've written, market work. So when you're launching best, right? Uh, market work is something where you cold call the trade and you help them sell. Second is amazing training. So you, you know, uh, have a training session with their sales reps, you know, ask for that. If you can't fly, you know, uh, due to uh, financial reasons, let's say, or maybe if you're internationally, you know, located, do a Zoom call. But in the training, you know, this is what we miss most of the time. In the training, you really want to focus more on how to sell your product, not so much on how it's made, you know, the winemaking or the distilling techniques or who the distiller is or where, which appellation the vineyard is. What distributors, sales reps want to know is the 30-second elevator pitch for your brand, the five most common questions that restaurants, bars, and retailers will ask for your brand. So have an FAQ sheet. You know, those are the things you want to cover in the training. And you want to become a likable supplier. They can see your energy. They, they have to believe in you because your goal is that that Monday morning, they take your product in their bag and show to their accounts, right? So that's the way you got to focus and design your training module. Uh, incentives. So for sure, you can have a distributor owner incentive, which the reps don't know. It's just for the owner that, okay, if you if you do 1,200 cases in a year, you know, uh, here's a $5,000 uh, uh, kickoff against the invoice, uh, or here's a check, right? And then you can have sales reps incentives. So sales reps incentives uh, come in many different forms. It can be opening new accounts. It can be getting a 25K stack. It can be getting a three K stack, it can be getting a secondary placement, which is in the cooler or at a different position in a in a store. You know, so design uh, some nice incentives. Now, these incentives have to be according to your brand journey, right? So, if I was just launching, I would focus on market work and new placement incentives. Then, in my second visit, I would focus on a ten K stack. You know, during October, maybe I would focus on a twenty five K stack incentive. Right, so you got to focus on different kind of incentives depending on the brand and the and and the calendar uh, year. You can also focus on uh, giving them in-store tasting support. This is the best marketing dollar that you can put back uh, or invest. So forget about any big consumer trade ads or big magazine trade ads or Facebook or whatever you know social media ads. The best marketing money in play is in-store tasting, right? So offer them Friday and Saturday in-store tastings for your brand. And what I would do is offer them like, okay, you have 50 in-store tastings. 
Usually that costs, you know, about $25 an hour. If you can't go and do it, you know, you can hire or they can do it for you and they can bill back you. Uh, so you do the math. So let's say, you know, that money has to be deployed for in-store tastings. And then the best part is, you know, uh, they will deplete your stuff. So you will, you know, when you roll out this prog the program for in-store tasting, I've seen uh, purchase order coming pretty quickly and depletions going in and that loop happening. So I would suggest that a lot. Point of sale support, you know, so as I said before, I was also a wholesaler. So people who uh, used to send me the artwork, I did not pay attention, but then there were some suppliers who printed their shelf talkers, who printed case cards, who shipped through FedEx. You know, I'm not going to take uh, the hassle of doing all the design and, you know, uh, all the artwork and wasting my money in there, you know, because I'm, again, you know, a small to medium sized distributors. I may not have FedEx Kinko's in house, right? So we're not talking about big Southern and Budweiser and Miller distributors here. Most of the distributors uh, that small and medium sized brands uh, ideally should work or end up working with do not have in house printing shops, right? So send them the finished point of sale, okay? Line pricing, super important uh, that you don't mess around uh, with the pricing because trust me, if you create friction in the way a retailer perceives the pricing or if they have to set up your products, if, if your Chardonnay is 666 and if your Merlot is you know, 699 and if your you know, uh, Shiraz is uh, 733, that, that's a bad thing. So you, you try to do a line pricing, make some money, you know, some places and lose some money, but come up with the line pricing, you know, that eliminates the friction. Branded cases, you know, believe it or not, uh, distributors want to just see your case and make the life easy for their drivers to load your case. It same goes with the retailers, right? So when they're stocking your products uh, in their warehouse, you know, it, it makes their life so easy. White, uh, coming from the distributor, uh, white cases are the worst. You know, people hate those white cases where they have to, open the box and see the brand. You know, again, I'm uh, creating the context here that you are servicing and dealing with a small to medium size distributor who doesn't have systems in place, right? So they're gonna just take a corner and put your stuff. Uh, and the best thing you can do is have branded cases. Have an FAQ sheet. You know, this is something which not many brand owners do because it forces them to uh, face the reality. An FAQ sheet will include the first question, you know, my pricing is high, what do I do? So you tell the distributors, rep, here's how you approach. You know, I already have an Australian wine. So uh, those kind of objections, right? Like what are the real objections uh, their reps will face when they hit the ground? So have an FAQ sheet for them. So these are some basic things that you can uh, help uh, your distributors and this will help them uh, sell more of your products. Uh, yeah, my name is Arthur. Um, I started Zaguska Vodka in May of last year. Um, it's an unfiltered vodka brand um, in Brooklyn, New York, and have been um, and have been selling it sort of door to door for the last eight or nine months. Uh, and very recently started to bring on some salespeople <clears throat> and looking to uh, approach some distributors in the next three to four months, probably. Um, so yeah, so this question I had is I, um, I want to put together, you know, a deck, a PowerPoint presentation or something for distributors when I'm approaching, when they inevitably ask me for, yeah. you know, a deck. Um, so, uh, yeah, I just wanted to get a sense of, you know, how many sure. slides should there be? What information should I cover it? I feel like it can easily sort of balloon to be a humongous thing that I, I feel like is probably unnecessary. So understood. Nice to chat again, Arthur. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Thank stuff. you for doing this. So this is a, again a very good question. Uh, you know, uh, I would suggest uh, have that big deck made anyway, just for internal use, and then you can use it in many different ways, right? Uh, it will it will be helpful. Once and all, make that big deck, and I'll I'll explain what that includes, and then I can go into a small piece of it as well. So uh, the big deck should include, let's say, the profit story. So it should include, uh, you know, why a retailer. Literally, this question: Why a retailer should stock your product? Why a distributor should have your product? Right. So you do a portfolio analysis, uh, depending on that, and then you create that context. That okay, I see that you have a you know, in your case, let's say you have a $10 vodka, but you don't have a premium vodka, you know, a high margin vodka and so on. So you could add that. Uh, you add, you have to uh, add why it's convenient to do business with me. So 
you know, you have to show them that you are going to take care of logistics. You you already stock at the place where they already uh, store their other suppliers, let's say Western carriers, you know, so you go to, I'm just giving an example, but you got to show them that it's convenient to do business with them. You're going to ship them point of sale. You know, you're going to come in, come in the market. Uh, they want to know that you are, you are reachable 24 hours. You will not run out of stock, you know, those kind of stuff. So just literally add why it's convenient, uh, why I offer convenience pretty much. Minimum order quantity, be very flexible, write it 56, mix and match, whatever you want to mix and match, those kind of thing, right? Uh, logistics, you know, so pallet configuration, the technical, case sizes, case specs, the six pack weight of a pallet, weight of a case, you know, because uh, they will calculate the trucking uh, logistics cost and those kind of things. Uh, this, this slide and this presentation will be sent to you guys. So uh, the video will also be there. Uh, so don't worry. Uh, sample policy. So usually, you know, uh, you know, uh, it's five, five to ten percent, and this is the best thing because you're giving in goods. So, you know, I would, I would just say, don't be stingy here. Like a lot of brands, you know, literally, like oh, uh, two bottles and one bottle. Like you're talking, you know, you're talking to a trade person. You know, they, they have no limits, you know, of this. So literally, just say, you know, our standard policy is ten percent, but in the first year, I do understand. My goal is to open new accounts. You know, let's go whatever it takes. You know, but then, then you ask the report, you know, what I did was ask them the sample depletion report. So you know how it's being used. So you make them accountable, but sort of, you know, give them sort of unlimited sample policy. Marketing policy, again, pick up location, pallet configuration, in market sales rep uh, and support, you know, how many times you're going to come in the market, flag dollar per case report, uh, support, no questions asked. $5 a case, you spend however way you want, Mr. Distributor, right? Uh, access to chains, uh, how we will help you get some regional chains and national chains. Uh, this is the longest and the best carrot uh, that you can give if you can afford. Like if you can afford and if you have connections and if you can actually get them total wines in the BevMos and the regional chains, you know, uh, this is a long play. So let's say you have this one year, you, you keep, give them even one account every year or two accounts, you know, that's a big, big uh, contribution to your partnership. Right. So if you can do add that uh, point of sale, show them the visuals, show them how your actual shelf talkers look, not the design view that your designer created an actual printout, an actual merchandise, an actual photo of a store. You know, so add that stuff. Do not add your graphics, add the actual visuals, you know, of how your product is looked in a festival food store versus in a mom and pop store versus. So add different views versus in a cooler in a secondary display. You know, uh, so what I did was every time, you know, some amazing distributor did amazing job at merchandising. And when I did the market work, you start taking pictures and update your deck. Uh, then how are you going to help them sell? You know, uh, like why adding your brand matters and so on. Right. So you show them this kind of things. Uh, but I will be I'll be happy to add when we send you the video and the comments we will add some more context to it and some other slide where actually I have. Uh, a real deck as well as an example. So I can send that as well, you know, but overall 70 to 70% should be you talking about their business. Okay. Not your business. You mm. talking about the distribution business, you know, and, and going to the previous thing about how you're going to make their life easy, you know, uh, previous slide. So you talking about that 30% or a couple of slides would be, you know, about you about why you started, about why you're passionate about this and so on, you know. Uh, again, uh, they will really bet on the jockey more than the horse and this thing is not spoken. But I know that when my top supplier came in the market, I was so happy because I know the guy is going to sell 300 cases in five days, you know, and we just liked him for that. Forget about he, he told me to add this to his uh, our portfolio. We will add it because we know it will sell. So it is really showing them that you, you know, Arthur is there to make sure that the brand is going to sell, you know, and that sort of thing. You have to sell, uh, put it in the deck. Cool. So we'll move on to the next one. Thank you. Uh, we we cool. have Tilithra from Red Hazel uh, in the group. Yeah. Hi, Tilithra. Hello. Hello. How's everyone doing? Um, right. I'm Trey here with Red Hazel Spice Whiskey. And I want to ask, how can I maximize my distribu distributor relationship? Um, right now, we're distributed in Georgia and Florida. 
We launched in 2020 and we have about 50 points of distribution between two states. And I want to manage that relationship a little bit better with our distributors. Um, in addition, how often should we be meeting with our sales reps or distributor uh, territory managers? I think obviously I'm I'm understanding. I'm, I'm, I'm going to answer based on the financial and what you can afford as well, right? So not just uh, like unlimited things. So let's say, you know, uh, I would say ideal market visits are two times. One is when you launch and one uh, you know, if you can afford a March uh, visit uh, and October visit. So March is when really retailers will start looking at new products. So you really want to go out on the street in March, knocking retail doors, you know, and create like even if it's one case, create the new accounts as a focus for March. And then October is when you want to go to that old accounts and uh, get that 3K, 5 second, 10K sort of displays, right? So I'll go back to uh, the main question, which is, you know, how, how to get the relationship closer, right? So a couple of other things that you can do is one is ask for depletion reports. I don't know if you if you ask or do you know what a depletion report is? Yeah. So yeah, ask, we, can, we can pull those in our portals. Right. So ask for them. Uh, so which means that you know what exactly is happening uh, there. Right. So wh who are your top accounts? So call those top accounts, you know, uh, sort of go and visit those accounts and do other stuff. But I think uh, what you really want to do is add value to the partnership. And that is the best way sort of uh, you can maximize the relationship. And adding value goes to the same things like they just want to make sure that your product is moving. You know, uh, so if you if your product is collecting dust, you know, you really need to say, hey, you know, your depletion report is saying that it's not moving well in this uh, 50 accounts. You know, can I do anything? Can I come there and do in-store tastings? You know, before before you already know what's going on from depletion report. Right. So you really uh, have to uh, give them the money for in-store tastings and make sure that before it's too late, you know, that retailers don't lose confidence. You sort of do in-store tastings. Uh, uh, market work and so on but i think i think mainly it is uh distributors are so they are the mature part of us so they they will be polite but what they really want is to make sure the goods are moving period you know they they want their their business their business is goods business just so you know right the real business is logistics and goods case is going out when the case goes out margins are coming in their account and dollars are coming in their account that's the business they are in so the more you do that you know, that's how you sort of become an important supplier, right? So uh, rest all will be more of a talk. And then for sure, you, you do your dinner meetings and you do your lunch meetings when you're there. But what they really, really uh, will admire is sell-throughs. Thanks, Dilatra. We have Hart as well, I think. Hart, you can just switch uh, on your audio. Um, hello, hi. Thank you for the time. Um, as a new brand here, um, I'm trying to launch my, my new product into the market. So I'm wondering if what kind of marketing and brand awareness can I do before reaching to local distributors if I were to sell them new products like craft beer, something that's really unique to the market because um, my products currently are like from Thailand and I knew like alcoholic beverages from here to the, like, to the market is going to be really, really new and it can be tough for many restaurants and distributors to sell also. So um, I'm wondering how can I do those marketing yep. and awareness? Yeah, and yep. also as someone who resides internationally, how can I get someone to represent my brand like in an early stage locally? So just you asking this question is an amazing start because in fact, this is the way to start. You know, so uh, literally uh, here, here's what you do. Uh, what you need to do is you need to get a sales rep first in the market that you are intending to go. So let's say you obviously can't do the entire US because it's huge. So as we discussed, you focus on the two tier, let's say New York, for example, or let's say where I would I would do simply where the highest sort of Thai population lives in US, for example, right? So you, you select that state uh, where the highest Thai restaurants are maybe, you know, uh, so you select those states and then you find a sales rep uh, and then how you find that sales rep is you ask the account that, hey, I'm looking to hire someone for my brand. You know, uh, give me some uh, three or four good names that uh, service you that you've been working with. You know, some wholesalers, reps are coming to your accounts and I would love to sort of, uh, you know, do that. And then there are some commission based reps who, of, you know, who will represent like five or six different brands and build 
a portfolio, right? So they're not loyal to just or committed to just one company, but they have a little bit of mix and match and commission-based thing going on if you can't really afford a base a salary person. But the ideal case is you need to buy the accounts. And the best and the easiest way to buy accounts, the retail accounts, is to buy the sales rep. You know, so you you hire someone uh, who has accounts and who has been doing business with this restaurants where you have the highest chance of conversion, right? So you get that person on board. It's worth to spend, trust me, it's worth to spend that $10,000 for two months to get that traction. And then you fly over there immediately and you sort of build your relationship immediately with those accounts. And then you go and approach the distributors that, hey, my beer is in this uh, 80 odd accounts. You know, so uh, I think that is the best way if you can afford $10,000, let's say. Uh, Otherwise, you will anyway end up spending ten thousand and two years. So this is the quickest and the best way uh, to sort of get started. You know, it, it solves a lot of problems. And uh, you starting from zero and building account will be a very very long uh, journey. So I would definitely uh, recommend international uh, brands to start with uh, an actual sales rep, right? Not a brand ambassador, a rep like who's done cold calling, who has accounts. So that's my answer for that. Uh, how can I get someone to represent uh, my brand early? So I think I've answered uh, pretty much the second question as well. You know, so this is this is how you get that kind of sales service what you need. Yeah. So yeah. should I stick to the local retailers to start with? Right. So uh, let's say, you know, you uh, I mean, the question is very clear, but I am just clarifying the question. Now, if you're doing good with your retailers, the local area, for sure, you can stick to it. And if you only make 10,000 cases or 5,000 cases or 500 cases and you have no selling problem, like you have enough that you are selling, then for sure, stick to the retailers. You don't want, you want to make sure that your retailers are not out of stock and you're, you have a nice loop going on and you focus on the, you know, sell throughs and your margins and you have a steady business. But let's say you can make more, you know, uh, and obviously you want to grow. So uh, for sure, you have to go into different markets and you have to grow. So I think, uh, Pretty much this question is, you know, I think we all can understand. It's pretty simple. But I, I would advise uh, to, uh, if you don't, if you can make more and if you have bigger ambitions, for sure, distribution and having distributors and importers uh, sort of thing is a bigger volume play, having national accounts. And when you hit those kind of accounts, they would need distributors, you know. Uh, also, you know, I would break this question into some other things. And based on my personal experience, let's say, you never know that maybe you can sell more in some other uh, network, right? So when I started my brand, you know, it was an Australian brand and I was in Australia at that time about 15 years ago. So I, I knocked doors in Australia, for example, and that was my local retailers and my region and my you know area. And the same amount of effort, the same amount of money, you know, uh, when I put that for six months uh, in Australia, it was 400 cases in sales and four cases in one shop and come again and come again and come again, come again and I'll think about it sort of thing. But the same effort I started putting in Delaware and New Jersey, I got 4,000 cases. So you can you can try other areas and other things, but if, if your effort is not yielding the result, uh, you know, you may move to some other market. You may be just selling 500 cases in your retail area and your local network, but maybe you know, your product is more suited for other region and there are bigger and better customers. So you can switch and try that as well. What is a good cold call or not a good introduction? So I think uh, I'll play this video. Let's hear from some other people. It's figuring out in a two second pitch how your brand and your product fits in with what they want. You try to be, to create empathy and trust in the first minutes, which is very difficult. And then you start with, with the product and all the point of sales you can, uh, you can, you can give them and, and to ensure them on, on many different levels. All right, so I had, uh, I'll again add this comments. We, we did a uh, video with four sales rep and the topic was literally how do I cold call? So it will be in the notes as well. Uh, and these are some established brand owners, right? Uh, uh, there is another video. Uh, this is from, this is my best, like, I love this guy, Jason. So he is behind the brands, like you may know, Yellowtail and Josh Sellers. Josh Sellers is the number one brand. So here's from the best salesperson we know. 
the selling story, it's all about the brand, but we forget to tell the profit story. Mm. Ultimately, the buyers that we are working with, the accounts that are selling our products, we want to make sure that they have a solid understanding of how to tell the profit story, not only how that affects the distributor that mm -hmm. they're, they're selling our products, but the customer that's going to be displaying our products. Mm -hmm. So it's important for suppliers to have a solid understanding of business math. They need to understand margin, markup. Mm -hmm. They need to be able to look at an item on a shelf and identify what the target margin that account, whether it's on-premise, off-premise, or corporate chain, is, is using. And then from there, we can actually apply that to our product mm -hmm. and talk about the profit story based on the deal. Understood. So if we're talking about, let's say, 35 points of margin, we want to be able to extrapolate that out to what that profit means, mm. not only on the bottle sale, the case sale, but the 5 and 10 case sale. So telling the profit story, each and every sales presentation that a distributor salesperson makes should include a profit story. Mm. What is their return on investment? Got so it. business math is a big part of success so, in the supplier world. I'll just have this uh, image as well. You know, I sell top quality wines and right so instead start with i'll do this 10 things for you right so you start you you simply uh have to focus more on what you will do for them uh, all right so coming uh to the next one how do i approach hotels i would suggest you know start with the normal mom and pop stores the you know start with the restaurant and bars and once you've figured that out you go to the hotels you know but for sure if you if you have a particular brand that you think it's pretty much suited for hotels then it's it's a good place to start but hotel is a harder sale okay but there are perks there are benefits hotels are huge customers like huge you know you would be doing easily 100 cases a month if you end up with a large hotel uh, they have a lot of different departments and I'll I'll, I'll explain uh, what I mean by that right so so hotels have banquets restaurants you know uh, catering department events department you know so you you uh, these are the things that you need to do uh, in order to figuring out how to approach hotels. So what the, an ideal approach would be this. You first need to figure out how many establishments and outlets are there in a hotel, right? You need to then figure out who are the players. There is a events salesperson who is taking care of the event space where also your beverage is consumed. Then there is, you know, the sommelier or the restaurant, you know, uh, manager. Then uh, there is in-room service uh, sort of way your beverage also is being ordered. You know, then there is mini bar. You know, that is a complete different way, usually controlled by head, a national chain, because then they just want Jim Bim and, and whatever, you know, uh, the big brands there. They don't want small brands there. So it's a very different way mini bar uh, works. So you need to figure out uh, there's five or six places. Who are the players? how the buying of each of these places happen because it's a separate thing. And then there is another myth that all the corporate buying happens at national level, including the Marriott and the Hiltons of the world. You know, you can easily go and cold call a local hotel chain as well, even if it's a Marriott. A lot of hotel chains, including the big chains, have, you know, given freedom to their local sommeliers and bartenders to sort of keep trying you know, uh, different brands. And especially if you are a local, like if you are an actual distillery or a, uh, you know, or a winery, uh, not a brand, but if you're an actual winery or distillery and you have a Marriott next door, for sure, you know, uh, there is a high chance that they would want to stock your product, right? So uh, they have that leverage. Should I stand firm on my price and move if the retailer low balls, right? I mean, uh, it just depends on your math, uh, you know, I'll share you my story, right? So when I started, uh, you get excited with any order, you know, you including the retail, like they'll squeeze you like anything. And then you will end up saying, yes, okay, 25K stack and 444 instead of 666. And you will say yes, you know, but then I realized that uh, I was just doing business on break even, you know, and then you think that, okay, maybe in the next order, uh, he will pay me 499. Then the third order, he will pay me 555 and so on. But that never happens. So, uh, getting retailers to pay more in the next order never happens. In fact, it's always a better deal for the next time, you know? So uh, I would suggest that make a minimum markup and then walk away from that retailer because you don't want that retailer. You want a good partner, you know, especially don't uh, hold your excitement. And then I learned the lesson, you know, when you are doing a business at break even. And when one or two of your customers don't pay, you are gone.
it's literally gone you know like you're out of the business and if this happens at the distribution level you're done like you are saying yes to a, a you know a small mom and pop distributor who's not going to pay your bill and you that will just affect your entire like dream you know so i, I would suggest uh, two things make money uh add more markups increase your price but reverse engineer the programming okay uh, and retailers know this game i mean they they will some some bartenders or some others will say what nonsense i mean you just give me direct good line price right but you say no you know i will give you 666 but let me come this friday and do the in store tasting okay uh, john why because you know i want to make sure that i really i'm able to build the brand at 999 okay so let me you know let me make sure that it sells through it's my my commitment but i don't want you to be the uh, the lowest retailer because i'm i'm really trying to build a brand here and i hope you understand you know so you try you try to sort of uh, convince them but uh, to summarize this uh, make at least at least at least minimum 15 to 20% you know do not go lower than that simple as that you know then do whatever you want well uh, local distillery local to indianapolis indiana uh, we're actually outside of indianapolis but we we've had a lot of success uh and a major chain Meyer came through and uh took on our our low proof moonshines in three states they took us on in Ohio, Michigan, Indiana. All three state liquor laws couldn't be different but <laughs> which is great uh being sarcastic there but um we are a local distillery and we I do I uh, think that we should be growing first in our local market but we can't pass these opportunities up so what you know what success have you seen and how how would you approach other markets even though we're local here to to Indiana and we're going to continue to focus on our home state i'm having difficulty how do i translate that message to the other states question so you don't have a selling problem you can make more you you want to grow more right correct yeah or you have a limited to... inventory no we can make more the moonshines uh you know the sugar and and yeah uh, we tons of indiana corn to to make the base we're great there we don't have a um we don't have a production problem it's more of uh once it's on the shelves then why in these other states uh because we have not we're relatively new 2 years into the game or or less depending on how you look at it here in the state of Indiana and now we're in three states and we could So why say, are you not going let's say in the other states like what is the main reason you aren't able to expand or expanding So we are we did uh we ha I have launched meetings uh with our distributor in Ohio all next month and then we just launched Michigan so we are doing some of the things you've even mentioned and we're targeting the states but funny enough our product has been sitting in the Meyer locations so over 100 locations in each state i've saw the distribution go out and then i have not seen any reorders we have not launched technically so there's no reps out re representing us but that's what our product sitting on the shelf at a major player is currently doing so i can foresee that i and hopefully obviously there's more talk but how would you approach going to another state uh even though you're local and we're a local distillery that's who, exactly who we are so first is uh i wouldn't expand uh any business at the current cost at, at the cost of a uh, current customer not performing you know uh that is number one priority in the business right so in your case and i'm sure you know the importance of you getting mire like it took me 5 years uh of crazy dog work to get into Kroger's you know uh like it's just it, it took me $5000 to see the buyer like literally just to get the meeting right you you should understand where you are at you know and here's what Kroger's told me that if if you're I'm going to give you 50 test stores and if your things don't sell in 90 days never show me your face again you know so but at the flip side the upside was so huge it was a million dollar purchase order nationally in 700 stores if things go well you know so i would just literally focus on getting that main account back on track uh as the number one priority now if that takes all your resources your money or your focus you know that is one thing but let's say you you are able to solve that problem and now the other thing is to grow in other state right so it is uh so one simple rule to follow uh is uh, this like when you think about business strategy it is usually uh old customers old products and then that has to grow then comes you know uh old products new customers and then comes you know uh new sort of products old customers 
this is this, the flow you have to go in when you expand. And then comes new products, new customers. You, you following me? So you you have to, it's a, everything has to win. All those four metrics has to perform and grow. And then you start growing your business, basically. So the penetration has to grow. The depletions have to grow in your current base. The sell-throughs have to grow. The speed has to grow. The volumes have to grow in the current accounts. That's the number one focus and number one metric in the business. Then comes, you know, okay, it's amazing. Now let me introduce my another flavor into this current account. That's the number two way to grow. And then, you know, take your main two or three horses and open new accounts and new markets, you know. So that would be an ideal approach. Uh, uh, I would, I would, I hope I've answered the question. Yeah. And I also can reach out direct to, uh, but yeah, that covered a lot of it. It's, and, it and coming back on your, on your, you know, your purchase orders are not getting through and you're, you get what your first pallet from your distributor and then that's it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a super classic, classic thing. And that's why, you know, that it's, we are in the business of the first order, right? So that means it's it's on us, and unfortunately, it's on us. They they will just do nothing, you know. They just wanted to add a moonshine in their portfolio. You came there, you got their first orders a little bit here and there, and that's it. They will do nothing. The distributors will not do much, and that is why I emphasize to add more margins and take ownership of more market work, more you know, being close to their customers. It's literally that use them as your delivery houses. Unfortunately, it has come down to that, you know. You, you have to use them. Uh, to keep on growing, you know, uh, and then you will have uh, after five years of this amazing hard work journey, you will have this big accounts like Myers and Kroger's of the world, and then you will have this distribution network, and then the loops will start. Uh, patience, I guess. Uh, you know, uh, five years in, six, seven years in, I, I that's where I think that we're going to start seeing big, bigger moves, but. It is interesting to watch it start this early on. Especially this big guys like Southern uh, distributors, let's say, you know, you will 100% just get the first pallet and then you will never get that order again. You know, and so- that's we are with, with in two states is Southern. Um, that's what uh, they do. It's a classic. Yeah. And then we're, then we're with a smaller distributor in Michigan. Uh, and uh, so we've seen a little more, you know, it seems like they're a little more aggressive. Yep. So, so you don't want to start with Southern. Southern, that size of the distributor is more of a service person. So you give them an account and then you go with Southern. So it's a chicken and egg problem, but at the last stage of your business, you know, chain and Southern. Without chains, Southerns won't come. Without Southern, chains don't come. You know, so that's the last phase. But when you start initially, it's just going to be exactly like this, like a, a pallet and then you forget. So you rather work with a small and medium uh, size distributor you risk a little bit of payments, I understand, but you 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 work with them and get them personal guarantee or something, but you work with a small distributor where sort of uh, you are making the money and they are important to you and you are important to them, that's it. A any distributor, I think that is like all those Johnson brothers or all those big old distributors and who have a big thick book, I it's a big no for a young brand. It's, it's guaranteed you're gonna just get a pallet order and that's it. Okay, what does a typical growth look like for local distilleries across the country? So yeah, yeah. What do you see in across the country? Uh, I know regions are different, so the coasts are different versus the Midwest. So I'll give you, I'll give you my example. Or most of the uh, the brands that reach a success of hundred thousand case, you know, it's literally a blueprint. You know, you you first start, and I think uh, you all remember Dogfish beer, right? Like when the whole craft uh, beer moment started, and Dogfish was one of the one of the great examples and i'll share this video as well uh, we have this amazing you know their sales manager gave a talk at one of our conferences and this was a, a classic model which replicates with most of the people brand builders you start with local which you are doing anyway right you start with local state now local can be you know 100 miles from your area now if you have you know in in case of delaware new jersey new york maryland let's say so that's called local you know you start with your 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 100 mile network for example, you penetrate that like anything, you start there, then you, you know, uh, pick up another network, it can be Midwest, South, West, whatever it is, but then there are some considerations you got to make in that, you have to change your pickup location, you don't have them, don't have the West Coast guy pick up at New Jersey, don't have the, you know, Californian guys pick up at New Jersey and don't have the vice versa, right, and, and so on. So you got to save on the logistics, you got to make a hub. So if you're doing Texas area, then you, you go Houston as a pickup location, you send there, you find a distributor, 
you know, uh, who you will store your product and then you have sub distributors, you, you give them a brokerage, like earn $2 a case flat, but I want my goods to be at your warehouse. And, and you know, sort of thing, you build little hubs and then you expand into the other network, like Midwest, for example, and that, that's your Illinois, Ohio, and so on, right? And then you penetrate there. Then there are some other inbound inquiries you make it, let's say, you know, okay, a Florida distributor just say, hey, we want to stock your product, right? It's a shotgun approach, basically. So you, you have some clusters here and there. So you can start there as well. That's the third phase. And then comes uh, this last thing, which I spoke about. It's time to sort of make movements within the distributors, you know, uh, which is, okay, John, you are amazing distributor in New Jersey, but guess what? You're just covering North New Jersey. I need to find a guy in South New Jersey near Philadelphia. So you go second distributor, That's the, the, then that phase will come. Then once that phase comes where you have three or four distributors in each state selling your brand, you divide the territory because it's your goal that states per sale grow, you know, with this small distributors. And that's all, all these things you got to include in the contract, by the way, that you are open to have another distributor and assign the territory. And those accounts will go to the another guy when you, when you get right, because in South New Jersey, you only have two accounts, for example. So that is that phase. And then comes the big phase uh, of chains and Southerns and the Millers and the Budweiser network phase, you know? So that is a typical journey that you have to sort of do. And the, the last phase is usually where you're doing 100,000 cases and you have this national orders and regional chain orders, you know? Other than that, you can have your nice, uh, you know, uh, model of uh, multiple distributors. Uh, in that state. And that again goes back to the same thing. Like some distributors, I also did this by the way. So my two brands are with some other distributor in New Jersey and my two brands, two SKUs, for example, are with some other distributor in New Jersey. So that way you diversify as well. All right. So I've written it here, local, regional, national, shotgun, anchor accounts. The last one is where you sort of keep dealing with the big retail accounts and, uh, you know, and then the distributors are just literally uh, servicing your, you know, brand. Uh, how do we best use our distribution partner when we are at the bottom of uh, the priorities? I think pretty much we've answered uh, the same thing, but I, I would say uh, use them as uh, a clearance house. Uh, unfortunately, as I said again, you know I understand your pain, but the, you know they, that's what they are. Use them, put that in your mindset. Then only you will start working and you will understand your reality. Use them as your servicing partner initially you know and then keep asking keep asking hey john i've sold a couple of pallets can your sales rep take do one round you know please and here's the incentive so you do 50 percent, and they do 50 percent, and that's the best way you sort of slowly you know uh, become a priority supplier and you know ask them for priorities and become priority supplier as well basically you have to become a priority that's what i'm saying you know so i'm just addressing very directly this uh uh, and I know a lot of brands when I when I talk about this or post on even, you know, wherever I post my content, you know, a lot of uh, brands say, oh, distributors are jack shit or this and that. They do nothing. But guys, you know, uh, please understand that that is the reality. The more you complain, uh, nothing's going to happen. So your complaining is just not going to help. That's the nature of the business and nature of the jungle right now. So distributors uh, use them uh, to service and give them the orders. Uh, so allow them. Uh, to work on your brand with little less margin, but tell them you want to do this. And hey, uh, the moment you bring in the orders and you have your reps knocking my brand, then you can add 5% more and I'll back off. So you can do that as well. Okay, great. Uh, first of all, uh, hi to Jeff at Moondrops. Uh, they do great work. Uh, I live in Indianapolis, Indiana market for log steel distillery and very familiar with them. So Jeff, best of luck to you. Um, my question is, with us being kind of more of a smaller brand, uh, what's the best approach with a regional restaurant group? We have, you know, several in Indiana that are 10, 20 restaurants in. They're not your national chains, but they're strong local groups. You know, what's the best approach to getting your, your you know, our bourbon brand or gins, on, not only on the menu, but featured so they just don't get put on a list and then fall off in six months. I think uh, one of the best way to get a regional group like that size, you know, 15 to 20 accounts uh, and in your own state, which you can, let's say, fulfill, uh, is exclusivity. 
you know, uh, if you can afford to start with that, let's say, you know, that would be a no brainer. So if you've not, you know, uh, gone into many other, you know, and then let's say if you are already in hundred different bars, but then you say, I'm not going to offer this program to another group like this. So you first, maybe you can start that way as well. Second is uh, to sort of uh, prepare your presentation or meeting uh, in making sure that the delivery to all the accounts uh, and the logistical information is same. The program, the launch plan, you know, that, okay, five cases on each store. Okay, uh, Monday, uh, we'll do tasting here. Tuesday, we'll do tasting here. Da, da, da. So you, you, are, you show them a consistency uh, with each of their account in staff training, with the dates, logistics delivery you assure them that you will not run out of supply and so on so you know i'll play another i, I have a video here from a restaurant buyer so you know she will talk more about it let me just see Alison, uh, what do you look for, you know, in a new brand? I think that that answer is twofold. It depends on the scope of the program that you're looking for. I recently, uh, we participated in uh, building a, quite a few national programs. And national programs, having a, awareness from a supplier perspective of where your wines are in the country and who currently supports, I was surprised by how difficult that through line was. And so from national accounts all the way through to delivering to the restaurant on multiple different state levels, being able to speak to product inventory timelines, and that requires a lot of work, but just an awareness of the logistics of where wine is, how wine can get there, uh, is Got it's, it. notice- so to, it's noticeable. Just to add the context here, you know, uh, we're talking about where, you know, a company like yourself, where it's a regional chain or a national chain, you know, you want mm-hmm. pickup locations of each state, you want distributors of each state, you want the line pricing of each state, you want the logistical info uh, when you're talking to a national or a regional buyer, right? Absolutely. And being able to get that information without necessarily having seven different people to talk to um, that aren't talking to each other. I think companies that really can um, communicate excellently on their back end that streamlines that buying process uh, completely separate from the product of the wine, just having the infrastructure there to get things done quicker makes a mm-hmm. huge difference to actually getting placements. Okay, so just uh, answering uh, the second piece of it as well, right? So I think just on the first one, basically uh, you really have a couple of other options, but those kind of buyers are more business uh, driven, right? They're not like the regional buyers, like 15, 20 restaurants, they're shrewd buyers and they're business buyers. So give them the business approach. You know, uh, you know they're, they're making decisions in the math as well. So if you have a case study, okay, here's uh, what, you know, will happen to your business if you do. And, the, and show them like new customers, for example, you can bring in actual new customer, new, you know, walk-ins, new teams, they're always looking for new footfalls, you know, so talk more business cases. Uh, I think that is a good way to sort of approach. And uh, I think uh, this also will cover your other bit, which will, will link to your first question, right? So uh, I did ask, uh, you know, some good buyers uh, and bartenders about your second question about how to get, you know, your uh, bartenders to sort of uh, feature and make cocktails for your brand and also feature like properly, right? Promote them. Uh, both of them answered, which made me think, you know, that brand ambassadors is the missing link. So if you can't afford, maybe you yourself be the brand ambassador, but understand and see what's written here, right? So what brand ambassadors do is actually they talk the language of a bartender and the supplier both, you know? So they have that empathy. They have, you know, they do understand what bartenders, because most of the time they have been the bartender as well, right? So uh, I think having a a brand ambassadors uh, really, uh, you know, talk about the mixology of uh, your product and then leaving it to the bartenders, okay, how are you gonna play with this uh, is an ideal approach uh, for that. So uh, again, this uh, has the details, but uh, we can move on to uh, the other question. But I think overall, uh, it is usually the financial benefit. It is usually allowing the freedom to the bartenders. Uh, and, and I think if you are just regional and if you're a distillery, especially and pitching your regional group, I'm sure you have an added advantage unless like an imported brand. You know, so you can really play around with a lot of local themes uh, as well, you know. And uh, what I usually did was 
use foot traffic as the best uh, case example. You know, an example is, okay, here's what we're going to do on social media, that our brand is now available in this. Our uh, brand is now available in, in this chain. I'll share my personal story. One more thing I forgot to say is I also have a gin brand called Poca, which is made in London and sold in London. And I'll exactly give you what I did uh, to do this, right? Uh, about eight months ago when I was in London. So uh, to this uh, 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 cafe cocktail bar, you know, uh, which is featuring my brand Coca, uh, which is a gin. And, you know, here's what I did. I, I told them that I'm going to document this meeting, by the way. We're going to uh, create this video. We're going to uh, post it out there. And my team will post it out, you know, that our brand is available in this. I'm going to send you some foot traffic. I'm going to put out your opening hours. I'm going to do Facebook ad of $50 in your region that my brand is available, go and try out, you know, can you run a happy hour uh, on, on this couple of days and I'll run the ad that way. So that way, what I did was made him do this feature, backed up with my hundred bucks, got the customer in there, you know, so you, you sort of use that hundred bucks to close the loop. And then I also uh, added, uh, you know, obviously we have some other things we can support with. You all can play around with your what you can do. Like we have some media assets like, London Drinks Guide. So that is a B2C platform. So I said, okay, we'll create a blog post and so on where I'll write a story that the Cockeye is now available in this uh, account and so on, right? So you 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 completely talk about what you're going to do. And then I had their bartender, you know, uh, play around with the cocktails while I was in the meeting. So, hey, can I can you make some cocktails and we'll document and take pictures as well because I'll create blog posts uh, and create stories of this. So in your meeting as well, you can say, you know, what comes to your mind, John? You know, what kind of cocktails you can do? Because you know what we can do? We can film this whole thing and put it on our social media and promote it as well. You know, some simple things like that, basically. Open for questions, Angida. You know, uh, it, I don't know how we're doing with the time, but... We already got two questions. So she represents a mezcal brand. So she has a question. Okay, my name is Jules. Uh, Katina is who you usually deal with. She's more of a logistics and uh, CFO. And she's there right now in London working with all of our... Uh, accounts which is it's the afternoon there and i'm here noon uh in miami so i've got the chance nice to be nice here. to meet you again jules we've, and we've nice met. to meet you again we met a few times we met at uh the conference that you had uh it was very lovely you did a little video there and we also did a video call um together with katina um she asked me and we were curious as to our question was we were number number one last year in 2022 and number two this year in 2023. And we mm. just feel we haven't had any kind of interest from any distributors, wholesalers, anything that's... So what are the tools that we can use being the number one and the number two mezcal as a brand new brand coming out in the last two years? How how do we get there we have a distributor we but we want to start working with other distributors and other wholesalers and it's been a, a really really difficult road and we just feel that we placed so well in your competition that there should be some kind of tools for us as an award winner like we were to to you know do that distributors wholesalers how can we get in what should we do what should we be doing besides the regular things that you always do but we should get some kind of priority since we won you know what I mean? Such a great position. I just feel, could you give us any more tools? Because our toolbox is empty. I got it. So uh, as far as like what we, as far as coming back on our competition as a customer, let's say, you know, uh, we'll, we pretty much do what we do, you know, for as much as we do. In fact, we do the most for the brands and other competitions, just to be very clear, mm -hmm. like too much value we give. Uh, I don't think there is any, lack there but uh let's say if, if i just keep this as a general question you know if you are a brand and won at some competition number one or whatever gold medal or 95 what i would do for example you know what is a real growth hack and what i would do uh, is things that are in my control so how i would okay. use it so i would literally do uh in my email marketing let's say i would use that as a title number one mezcal in the world okay Literally, you know, and then, hey, uh -huh. folks, you know, uh, exciting to share this news. You know, we've been just awarded this as a new brand. You know, uh, this is some exciting, exciting, super news. And I wanted to uh, 
you know, have a quick chat with you on why this makes a lot of sense uh, for us to do business. You know, we'll just show them that you are picking the distributor. I would do that. So we are just starting out in the Miami. I've got a lot of interest in the market being the number one, you know, uh, and I just wanted to make sure, you know, I, I just wanted to talk to you and see, you know, if we are a great fit. And I want to prove uh, that I am a good fit for you because looking at your portfolio, I think, you know, you have tequila, but you don't have a mezcal. And, you know, I can see that you're, you know, uh, agave based uh, focused uh, distributor and so on. Right. So you you sort of create uh, that hype, that excitement in your tone, in your email and some growth hacks. Like, as I said, like title has to be number one. So they open number one mezcal in the world. So they'll open instead of looking for distributors, for example, you know. Uh, that is one thing. And then even when you're cold calling or something, hey, you know, uh, just wanted to uh, introduce ourselves. We've just won at uh, number one mascot in the world at London Spirits Competition. And then you add the context. This competition is just by real trade buyers. And then you connect the dots. You know, uh, these are your customers, Mr. Distributor, who have judged, you know, and awarded this. So I just wanted to send the samples and uh, at least start the conversation here, John. You know, uh, if I can uh, send the samples. You taste the product yourself and you see the quality. And, and we are so passionate about, you know, building this brand that we will make sure that it sells through for you. I'll come there, do the market where you, again, stick to the basics, you know, and create a sales process. Okay. What a lot of brands or companies don't have is a sales process. What that means is lead sheet, target sheet, you know, how many emails are you going to send? How many samples are going out of your door? Like, do you have, let's say in your case, a target for number of samples going out to distributors, you know, so those kind of things, you need to hit 80 samples a month, for example. Now, out of that 80, are 10 saying yes, you need to focus on the samples versus uh, sale conversion ratio, right? So it's this, we are in the sales business when we talk about this. So I, you know, I, I say this in a very clear way that when you're making, you are in the art business, but when you are selling, you are in the sales business. And yes. you are in the business, basically. So that's a two different things. You know, I love you. Let's say you all are entrepreneurs and passionate and everything. But when you are actually knocking the door and wanting distributor, you need to have a sales mindset and come up with completely sales documents, basically. And Listen, you know, we, we pound on doors everywhere, my girlfriend and I, because we're mm -hmm. co-owned and we throw the bottles. In but Jules, so let me ask, let's, let's go deeper there. I get it, I get it. Let's let's go deeper there. What is the number one objection? In your case, to my knowledge, it's a price. It's a $100 sort of thing. What what it's, what are the five objections which people have to tell me? twenty pounds, correct. So, so tell me what, you tell me, what are the five top objections that retail accounts are telling you we have no objections from retail accounts we have problems getting wholesalers so what our are they saying are, are no problem we have bacchanalia we have sexy fish we have artisan we have cavita we have uh nobu we have incredible okay. incredible, incredible accounts but we can't get service because we cannot get a wholesaler We've just we just barely have taken on Venus right now. Speciality has been a difficult a difficulty for us. Champer, I mean, it's just I I don't know how to get a wholesale to save my life. And we have amazing accounts. But you have and the retail accounts. Have enough accounts for this. That's amazing. Accounts. So you have the retail accounts. Let Let's just stay here. You have the retail accounts. Yeah, we, but we still have having... retail accounts. They They love us. Our retail accounts love us. We're super happy with that. But we need to okay. service. And we cannot Understood. get wholesalers to service them. Understood. So you have Venus. Venus is a good house. What is happening there? Let's say. It just started because they wanted uh, either 10 individuals or six like Nobu if you have multiple or uh, those kind of things. But what happens is that our, the people that we have all deal with different wholesalers. Like we just took on Annabelle's. They're champers. You know, Bacchanalia is champers. So we're trying to get in with them. Speciality has just... I don't know, shut the door on us for what reason I don't know quite yet. So um, everybody wants to order through them like Nobu and everybody's been writing to them. Uh, we're trying to do the drinks club. We're trying to do, uh, you know, Enotria. We've met with a lot of people and it's just, you know, it's been a difficult road for us to find a wholesaler because everybody uses different wholesalers except for speciality. Everybody uses speciality or they use drink clubs, champers, Venus, Inotria. Do you know what I mean? So it's split up. And if you can't get enough, we have like 17 amazing accounts, but if you don't get enough in that right basket, 
it, it just, I, I can't service my accounts. Have you asked uh, the retailer to introduce you to their wholesalers? Yes, they write emails. St. Martin's Lane, Gilgamesh. Uh, I mean, we have brilliant clients. Our, our clients are insane. And they all... So uh, here's what I would do. Here's what I would do. And I've done this. So uh, you pick a couple of retailers. You build big volume in that retailers. Let's say you yeah. literally say, uh -huh. you, know, you do that. And then you tell that retailer that I need this favor. I just need that favor. You do a phone call. You make that introduction. You make that meeting. Let's be three of us go for a lunch or dinner. They invite the distributor. And then you do face-to-face. -face. It's not email thing, right? Face-to-face. -face, you three sit where your customer, the retailer is there. The wholesaler is there. You tell them that, look, you know, I want to get started here. And really, really, you show them the commitment. And that's how you get that then distributors will not say no. It's a very hard for distributors to say no if their retailer customers say that take this brand. Distributor and wholesaler. There's a difference between distributor and wholesaler. I, I mean, I'm just talking mainly US here, which is yeah. the same thing. In UK, I don't know what is the difference. Okay, are you talking US? Okay, because I mean, th I thought this was a competition for the UK. Yeah, I mean, explain me the difference. I mean, I, I can okay. elaborate. Well, distributor helps to import and hold your product in the warehouse, but they don't do anything else for you. And wholesaler is the supplier. Nobody wants to buy directly from our distributor, which they could actually get the product cheaper, but they don't want to do it. They yeah. have certain wholesalers that they deal with, maybe two, maybe three, speciality champers, speciality drinks club, speciality venus. Un understood. understood. Um, so in, in, in your case, I'm saying... Understood. So in your case, I'm saying go and find the wholesaler, ask the buyer to introduce you to the wholesaler because it's the same thing in the US, like importer distributors, you know. So uh, in your case, it is the same sort of structure anyway. So you have to ask for a face to face. Uh, basically, here's here's how my story happened, right? I got into uh, this biggest account in Delaware, uh, let's say, who stocked. Uh, my 25 case uh, stacks and I was selling 400 cases a year and that account introduced me over a dinner with NKS distributors which is a Budweiser distributor house you know when that guy told that you want to take Sid's product that guy take, takes it you know so you have to sort of do a nice face-to-face -face, this kind of thing where your buyer a retailer is telling the distributor that do business with this brand I will support her like that you know, that's the only that's the only way that we even got Venus because I have a very good friend of mine from Marbella who reopened a club in London. But just so you know, that's Venus, where that's you are at. We want this product, and we want just, it. Just so you know, you're doing good. You know, I don't know why you're creating pressure. This is the normal stuff. You're you're good. This is how it. <laughs> you know, <laughs> seriously, this is good. All right. I just feel frustrated no, because I'm this is good. Don't put pressure on yourself. Money. Focus on sell throughs and that's it. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. I appreciate you taking the time to speak to me. All right. Thanks. Hey, Sid. This is uh, Terry Briggs. How are you? I'm good. Thanks. Good. So quick 15 second introduction. I, I do a couple of things. Um, in the USA, I own Santeri Inc. We are licensed distributors in Louisiana and in Georgia. Mm -hmm. And in Central America, I own, and a group of private equity investors own the majority interest in the Panama Red Rum brand mm -hmm. in Panama. But a uh, couple of things I wanna make the comment on, cause I, I wanted to hear what you had to say, what you had to say to brands uh, for anyone that's listening. I've heard this entire thing from the start to the finish. And everything that Sid Patel has said is 101% correct. <laughs> you have said everything spot on as to how distributors think and feel. And it's it's been refreshing and, and a learning experience for me to hear how the brands should be approaching distributors like myself. Um, but the, the question that I had, because I, I've been in this business now for almost two years, I've invested a significant amount of money uh, as a venture capitalist in the distribution business, it appears to me that in order for the distributors and small distributors and the small brands, they're pretty much locked arms with each other. 
And it is very political getting into the large accounts. And when I say large accounts, I'm talking about restaurant groups above six uh, restaurants or places like Total Wine and More mm-hmm. or some of these chains that you mentioned in the Midwest. We have um, it, it's very, very political. And in fact, uh, I actually have hired a lobbyist uh, who's on payroll for me. And he's been on payroll for the last six months and he's been assisting and getting us into some of the accounts. Is that as a as a distributor that's been in the business for two years? Is that just how this alcohol, the drinks business is that it's pretty much just political? And if it is, it would appear to me that the best route for a small distributor, small brand, as you're saying, to get with a small to medium sized distributor such as mine, it would appear that the best opportunity for us is not to go to the large retailers or large restaurant groups but really just to focus on those small accounts that exist within the 100 mile radius. I will be quiet and listen to your answer. Thank you, sir. So uh, I think a back first question on the distribution business, right? Uh, a classic small to medium distributor. And, the, you know, I think the brand should hear the story about even the distributor. It's even tough business guys, you know, for distributors, it's even tough because, you know, to get new retailers and to get salespeople, on the base salary or commission, it's very tough, you know, until this thing happens, right? Until you have a winning brand in your books, you know, you are in a struggling mode. So I'll explain, uh, you know, the reality of the business, right? So as I said, I was a wholesale, I we had a wholesale house in New Jersey and Delaware. I was at a portfolio and everything. So until and unless you don't have a brand that retailers want, till that time, your business is in the push business. You are just going out every day, you know, begging uh, for orders and begging for money, two things, and begging sales reps to stay. You know, uh, I'm trying to figure out this commission versus base model and trying to retain. So this is a problem for a small to medium-sized distributors until things change, which do change uh, by two ways. One is till you get uh, your own brands moving and uh, retailers want you, or you get a brand. What we did, uh, what I did was I got some big important brand uh, which was sort of a big brand, which should have uh, gone to Southern, but somehow I convinced, hey, come, I'll sell more than Southern because I know things change if we get a big brand. So imagine if you were selling Yellowtail, right? Uh, so on. So you 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 sort of get that big brand and you make that investment. That's called a business investment you would do. Rather than doing this whole journey of five years, you can go for a big brand. That's one. Second is, yes, uh, there is politics. There is, uh, I would say politics is business, right? Business, money, whatever, you know, you call it. But even Budweiser and Miller have to ask for business, Terry, as we all know. You know, even the Miller guys have to say, you know, say no to Budweiser, I'll give you more money. Budweiser guys are doing the same thing. So, you know, who are you and I if Budweiser has to beg, for example? Okay, so here's, here's my take on what to do and how to do it so uh, i think don't you should continue aiming high i mean you should because you want to aim high so you should go for this bigger accounts like 15 20 accounts you should go for national things you should do that and you you just have to figure it out you just literally uh have to uh, convince them by sheer effort by sheer depletions by sheer uh case studies and so on And, and that's how brands are built you know that's that's how Someone is there, you know, we all get this hot brands report. Some some newcomer is there who we are seeing every year, right? So that guy is hustling out there and you got to just keep on doing. But things do change for a distribution business. The moment you, you know, that things reverse where you have retailers asking for some of your brands and that is a one classic uh, way you can transition your business and, and or get a big, big popular brand, uh, pay some brand equity to do a swap. And uh, I think one more question, one more thing you asked was, you know, should I stick with uh, small accounts or should I stick with small dist- distributors and so on? It's a journey. You start this way, you move on. You get the 15, 20 case, uh, 20 account distributor in South, let's say some other area, you go with some other distributor. You just have to keep on moving. If you don't move, you will not evaluate. You know, if your goal is 200,000 case brand, this is exactly what you will 
have to do. So it just depends on what your end goal is. When I when I started, I was like super young and very like ambitious. You know, I'm still, but that time I was like dreaming. I, I'm, I was like dreaming. Okay, I want to build a million cases. I want to be in Walmart. You know, but now I have, I have reality. So I just want to make hundred thousand cases. You know, that's enough. So, sure. uh, uh, you know, then then you start making mistakes, but that passion will allow you to give you that. Okay, I, I'll move here. I'll do this and that. And then there is distribution buybacks. I'm sure you you know a little bit about that as well, right? So you you say, okay, you, your brand is in this account and I'm going to buy this account, this current business. I'll give you $20,000 for this, whatever, uh, 50 accounts. You give me this account and you, you just have to keep on moving. I mean, you got to sure. keep on moving. I wanted to make one comment since you made brought up the word Walmart. Uh, there is a wine brand that we distribute now that's based out of Louisiana. Uh, she is the only female-owned winery in Louisiana, started in 2017. Um, uh, and she was doing very, very well uh, in terms of movement of cases and everything and accounts. And she ended up getting into Walmart. And the way Walmart works is that they, whatever Walmart discounts it to, they expect you to eat it. And that Walmart business damn near put her under the ground. So I just yeah. want to say that to a lot of people who, to people who may be listening to brands, that when I talk to the brands that come to me, I tell them, if you want us to get you into Walmart, you need to go get another distributor because Walmart will break you and break me. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? 100%. 100% yeah. agree. Yeah. But uh, I appreciate your advice here, and I will take everything well noted, and uh, we will continue slugging along. Yep, absolutely. All the best. It's a tough business, uh, but uh, I'm sure you will have uh, some, some brand which will uh, help you in your journey. I think it's, it's the brands that usually turn the boats or the amazing sales reps. <laughs>